work as a librarian at the uh, Bodleian Library and at the British Library. Uh, so I've seen a few books. <laughs> um, and this has been an ongoing project for uh, quite some time. Uh, fundamentally, looking at his own memoirs, Karl Patrick's own memoirs from the uh, 13th century. Um, it's not necessarily written directly by him, perhaps dictated as well. Sometimes has a flavour of being uh, dictated, uh, but it looks fairly genuine anyway, the, um, the, what he writes. It's a, it's a little bit erratic in parts as well, which you would expect if there was some dictation going on to a, um, a disciple or a student. Um, so firstly I'd like to give a little bit of uh, geographical and historical context. Uh, this is the area that he operated in, okay, to start with. And uh, he started off near Dege here, in uh, East Tibet, and on the banks of the uh, Yangtze, and then uh, eventually, not until he was midway, th well, in his 40s, more than midway through his life, uh, he went uh, to central Tibet and then he received the invitation from Kublai Khan as well uh, here. And then he went across up here uh, to northeast Tibet, west China, uh, met Kublai Khan, and then there's quite a sort of involved story there. And uh, he left him after a while, and then went up to, he received an invitation from Mongi Khan, who was Kublai Khan's elder brother, uh, and who was actually the, um, the uh, Kagan of Khans at the time. So he ruled, uh, Mongi had actually been all the way over to uh, Kiev and Hungary um, in about 1240, uh, but he met him uh, in 1256 uh, there, and got on very well. Uh, he hadn't got on so well with Kublai Khan, unfortunately, as we'll see. And, uh, but then Monge left to come further south, and because uh, they were in the process of uh, trying to conquer uh, China, which took another uh, 30, 40 years. And in fact, it wasn't Monge who achieved it in the end. And uh, in the meantime, Kamapakshi went across here to where the Chagatai, capital was at the time, uh, which is another Khan family, and uh, but he didn't get on so well there. Uh, he, he, he doesn't talk about it much. And then he proceeded back along the Silk Road. He crossed across the desert here, and then proceeded along the, one of the Silk Routes, uh, along back down to here. And uh, well, we'll pick up the story of uh, what happened uh, there, and then eventually he was forced to uh, go across uh, to uh, Zanadu, or Shangdu as it became known, and uh, he spent a couple of years in, the, in what I posit is uh, this area. Could possibly be this area, but I suggest that it's uh, this area. You'll see the arguments in the book a little bit. And then eventually uh, he was uh, released, shall we say, and then came back on his way home uh, in his uh, late 60s, uh, 70s, and uh, came all the way back to East Tibet and back to uh, Tsurpu. And this is where the main monastery was. So he starts off in uh, Dege. And he's quite important uh, for Tibetan history because he's acknowledged or said to be the first reincarnation. Well, that's a bit of a mis... Because in the Buddhist terms, uh, everybody is a... a in incarnation, but it began this tradition that then, with the Kamapas in this case, uh, then developed all and spread all over Tibet and into uh, Mongolia as well, Central Asia. So the idea spread uh, really after uh, him. He's, he's called the first incarnation, it's, it's a bit of a misnomer, but uh, it, it's adequate really. Uh, but the, the general idea uh, come, stems from uh, him, and that's been going on for 800 years now. So uh, we're down to the uh, uh, 17th Kamapas. Uh, so he was born in uh, 1204 near uh, Dege, and here I've got a, a map. 
please look at it later. Uh, it's just uh, northwest <coughs> of Dergate that he was born, uh, in a community beside the river. And he was quite precocious as a child. He could read without being taught. He could read scriptures, not very uh, easy to read, perhaps. And he actually earned uh, money by reading them in households where, presumably, people couldn't read. Uh, but at the age of 11, he decided to go towards central Tibet to further his learning. But he didn't get very far because uh, south of Chamdo, <coughs> somewhere in this area, uh, he came across on a hill, uh, he came across this lama, and they met, and that he said, you know, S -s stay with us overnight, sort of thing. And that evening, the lama, Pondrakpa, his name, uh, gave an initiation a ceremony, and after the ceremony, he called this 11 year old aside and said, uh, I had visions of Dusum Kempa who'd been dead for uh, 13, 14, well, no, 20 years by now. Um, and I think that you're connected to him. And, that you, and eventually it was determined that he was uh, a reincarnation of him. So Dusum Kempa was Pondrakpa's teacher's teacher. So it doesn't look as though Pondrakpa actually met Dusum Kempa, but it was his teacher's teacher. And he'd had several visions of him, but he particularly associated, uh, when he saw it uh, uh, surrounding uh, Dusum Kempa sur and other figures surrounding the 11-year-old, um, he made this connection. So he said, stay with me and learn here, rather than go on to uh, central Tibet. So he decided to do that, and he learnt uh, three main uh, topics. The, uh, the songs of uh, Saraha, the Doha of Saraha, uh, the Mahamudra of Gampopa, and what's known as the introduction to the three kayas. And this latter teaching became Kamapakshi's in his adulthood, uh, his sort of favorite teaching, that when he was acting as a missionary, uh, he would teach uh, far and wide. He ta taught both uh, emperors. <coughs> uh, but after a while, a few years, the Pondraka recommended that he go up, go to uh, Katok, which is a monastery sort of south of Dege. It's a Nyingma monastery. This is not Kagyu or Kagyu. The Pondrakpa was of the Kagyu school, deriving from Milarepa and Mapa. Uh, and he studied there, uh, became ordained and studied for a while. And we can see in his uh, works later that he refers to a lot of uh, Nyingma Tantras as well. So he was quite, uh, how should we say, balanced in that way. And eventually, in, in fact, in the 19th century, the, the Rime movement, uh, well, Kama Chagni in the 17th, uh, referred to Kama Pakshi as being uh, an early influence in this idea of uh, not being quite so uh, sectarian. And uh, he studied there for a while, uh, at Katok, south of Dergi, and then he rejoined Pondrakpa, south of Chamdo, over here, and they decided to move further south to uh, Markham, because, uh, well, as he says, there was uh, trouble or danger from Mongol raiding forces. So Mongols would sometimes come down this side. They wouldn't so much go in the highlands, well, they did, but uh, at this time, uh, he decided to go further south, went down to uh, Markham, and unfortunately there, uh, Pondrakpa died. And uh, Kamapakshi was somewhat uh, despondent, shall we say, and perhaps didn't know quite know what to do, really. And then eventually, through a series of visions, he decided to go into retreat at a place called uh, Pungri, just a little bit further over here. and. It's quite a remote uh, uh, hillside, uh, well, on top of the hill. And we can see the, uh, the ruins nowadays. I've, I've had some nice pictures from Catherine Brown uh, of the ruins uh, that purports to be where Kamapakshi was. Uh, he spent 11 years there. Uh, and 
Uh, at one point he went further south to, there's a sacred mountain, Kawakapo, here. Uh, still hasn't been climbed. Uh, it's claimed quite a few mountaineers' lives in, in the 20th century. Uh, it hasn't been climbed yet. Uh, but it is circumambulated as a, as a sacred mountain uh, of the east side of Tibet. Uh, and he did a, a circumambulation, a pilgrimage there, then returned back to retreat. Uh, so he did in all uh, something like 13 years. And then, by this time, he'd got quite a reputation for his uh, meditative powers, miraculous powers even, and had gathered around him something like 500 students on top of this hill in this remote area near Batang, directly south of uh, Dege. And uh, he decided that it was perhaps, this is in his uh, sort of late 30s, early 40s, uh, it was time to engage with the heritage of Dusan Kempa, who had been dead for 50 years by now. And so he, he went to some of the monasteries of Dusan Kempa and started to uh, repair them and help invigorate the, the small sanghas that were there. Uh, and uh, Kama Gung and uh, particularly uh, yes, Kama Gung and uh, Kampo Nena as well. And it was when he was at uh, Kama Gun, up here, that he, um, he was beseeched by some uh, monks from the Shangshong area to come to Tsepu, which was the main uh, monastery that uh, Dusun Kempa had established shortly before his death in uh, 1193. So this is in the uh, uh, 1240s, and uh, so Karmapakshi decides to go to Tsepu, and when he got there, he found that it, the building was somewhat in ruins, and the monks, the Sangha was somewhat in ruins as well. The monks had taken to drinking and so forth, and uh, so he spent quite a bit of time there repairing, and it was something of a theme that he would repair uh, monasteries. When he was later traveling in this area, uh, you can imagine quite a lot of destruction from warfare between Mongols and Chinese over the years. And also there was antagonism with the Taoist uh, uh, sect as well. And the, so he engaged a lot in uh, repairing and enhancing as well. But he spent about six years there. And meanwhile, Kublai Khan, based in this area at the time, had come further south down uh, to just north part of uh, Yunnan on an expedition uh, to the uh, Dali uh, kingdom. And he'd quickly uh, overcome them, you know, quick surrender, and decided to go back up. So it was quite a, a quick expedition. But so going down and up, he probably heard about Kawapakchi at this time, and this um, amazing uh, person who you know, spent numbers of years in retreat and had miraculous powers. And he issued an invitation, a messenger, who came over to uh, Tsopu. Kublai Khan was not emperor at this time. He was the younger brother, well, the second brother of the uh, current er emperor, Mongkhi Khan. And the messengers came and invited uh, Kamapakshi, and he was somewhat doubtful. If you remember, he'd, he'd run away from <laughs> Mongols before. And so he actually expresses uh, the doubts about this, should I go or should I not go? And again, with vision helps him make up his mind, and he decides to go uh, across. So he goes across uh, to meet uh, Kublai Khan, and eventually he meets him up in this area. Not quite sure where it was, but I posit that it's uh, in this area up here. And at first he got on very well in the court, and. Uh, he gave some teaching, particularly on the uh, Bodhisattva vow. This is to a warrior uh, prince and uh, was well received. But after a while, uh, Kamapakshi himself felt that there was going to be trouble. He had a premonition that there was going to be trouble in the court. And he decided to leave. And this did not uh, please uh, Prince Kublai Khan. So he left and proceeded in these areas here, continuing to preach and help uh, restore. He'd actually built uh, a small monastery as well. 
uh, in 101 days, apparently. Um, and the, it was in this area, still not decided to return either to his homeland or to uh, Tsurpu. Uh, in fact, at one time he did have a vision telling him to return. He started returning and then he had another vision <laughs> saying, uh, no, you should go north. And at that time, messengers arrived uh, from Mongi Khan inviting him to Karakoram which at that time was something like, uh, well, it must have been quite an important place, a huge melange of um, <coughs> people there. There were Europeans at Karakor. Uh, we, we do know of that. Uh, we know Rubric, uh, William of Rubric had gone there. Um, unfortunately, he arrived and left in 1254. Kamapakshi arrived in 1256, so uh, they didn't meet. Uh, and he, without expressing any doubts this time, he decided to go uh, north up to Karakoram. And I'd just like to pause a second there, just before he meets uh, Mongi Khan, because I feel that there are three main uh, segments of his life that sort of confirm, in his mind perhaps, <laughs> the, uh, the fact of reincarnation, of his being a reincarnation of Dusan Kiempa. And the first one was, the first sort of stage was the being told by Pondrakpa as a child that uh, you have a karmic connection with uh, Dusum Kempa. Now Dusum Kempa, when he was alive, had uh, dictated uh, some life stories to uh, his students. And his name, Dusum Kempa, means Noah of the three times. So he knew the past, the present and the future. So he told his students some of, quite a few of his past lives uh, and also a certain amount about his future as well. And at one point, as students would, I suppose, they said, well, where are you going to be reborn next? <laughs> I want to find you. Um, and he gave uh, three examples of where he would be reborn. And of course, this was recorded now, Kamapakshi presumably knew about, well, he didn't know about this, but two of them definitely didn't, one was like a king in, uh, somewhere, and another was way over in the west of Tibet. The other one was that I will be re reborn for the sake of one person. Now, in terms of Bodhisattva vow, the idea is that you continue in your Buddhist path in order to liberate all beings that you don't try, you know, for Buddhahood necessarily, uh, that you just keep on working uh, towards the benefit of all victory to say, for this saintly man, to say that I would be reborn for the sake of one person. And uh, it seems that this must have puzzled him somewhat. But as he was approaching Karakoram, it does seem that he uh, twigged that actually it was for the sake of this emperor, the emperor of the world at the time, that he was being reborn. That if he could instruct him, it would be hugely influential over other people. That was um, how he put it. Um, and so that seems to be the second. There's a third uh, uh, point later on towards his death. Uh, and as he approached, uh, there were various you know, meteorological miraculous signs, of a big storm and meteors actually falling from the sky and uh, then there was a rainbow so it was all quite auspicious and Mongi Khan uh, accepted him uh, which was quite something for an emperor and just you know, this person turning up from the middle of nowhere across the desert and uh, he just said to him they had a you know he had an audience with him and he said to him uh, I'm the emperor of the world I need you to remove my obstacles. <laughs> and Kamapakshi, um, bless him, <laughs> said, I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about it overnight. Yeah? Which was quite a brave thing to do, I, I would have thought. Well, he did think about it, and in the morning he had another audience. And uh, he, it's in the, I could read this shortly, this short passage perhaps. Um, the, 
Yes. Kamapakshi replied, Tonight I will think about it a bit. A somewhat brave reply to make in front of a warrior emperor. In the morning of the next day, Kamapakshi again had access to Emperor Monge and gave his recommendations as recounted in verse. This is Kamapakshi's uh, memoirs. Indeed, in this imperfect world, never will there be a king like you, whatever any astrologers have said. I myself, Kamapakshi, seek to counteract your obstacles. Benefit the Buddha's teachings and all beings. Distribute food and wealth throughout the kingdom. Repair the residences of the Lamas and make sky offerings with no sense of loss. Again and again, I ask you to set free the criminals kept in the prisons. It may have been referring also to the sort of war hostages as well, um, to release them. And curiously, uh, Monge seems, according to Komapakshi anyway, it seems to have done this. He uh, uh, opened up his uh, treasury and gave away uh, several times um, uh, food and, and goods, uh, uh, promoted uh, the Buddhist teachers, uh, helped, uh, in fact, helped with the consecration of a, uh, of a temple, um, Avalokiteshvara Chenrezig Temple in Karakoram. And uh, also set free the, uh, uh, 13 times set free various prisoners. Um, not necessarily all of them, it's not quite clear, but maybe some each time. Uh, not only that, but uh, Kamapakshi says that he, and there's a certain degree of corroboration of this in uh, a legal text, that it's a different story, uh, that he got Monge to issue an edict that there would not be the killing of animals, no, nor hunting, no hunting and no killing of animals on four days each month, so which is quite unusual for um, a Mongol warrior, one would have thought. Uh, so they got on very well, and the uh, and Arik Boke was the very younger brother uh, in his court as well, and Kamapakshi gave uh, initiation and teaching, uh, particularly the uh, Chakrasamvara teaching. Uh, that was at the time where this. Uh, drinking episode <laughs> occurred uh, where he, he drank dry the uh, the Mongol court apparently. Um, I suggest it might have been part of the famous fountain that was built by a, a created by a Frenchman there but uh, just one part of it which could have been re you know, reported as drinking it dry the Mongol court because it's hard to imagine but anyway uh, but he wasn't inf influenced he said it was like uh, water into water he wasn't um, uh, influenced by the alcohol, and then proceeded to give the initiation. But Monge, of course, is still a warrior, no matter um, how much he... Uh, he meditated as well, Monge. According to Karma Pekshi, he was very adept at Mahamudra meditation, uh, which is, again, quite surprising. Uh, but he, nevertheless, he was, his job was as a warrior, a conqueror, and he uh, gathered his forces and proceeded uh, south into China in, uh, this is 1257. In the meantime, Kamapakshi left him and went across to Almalik over this area and as I said before, uh, didn't seem to uh, hit it off there. With the, the court there was more inclined towards uh, Islam. So the, it was actually a, a young uh, Khan there, who was mostly influenced by his uh, mother. He was, he was only, uh, yeah, it was um, sort of regency, really. And uh, so Kamapakshi didn't uh, spend much time there. And then he came down, I think it may have been uh, uh, Kucha, it could have been uh, Tofan. Uh, and uh, importantly, near here, he had a, a very vivid dream of um, a huge Buddha statue who spoke to him. And the Buddha, oh, sorry, a huge Buddha, and the Buddha said, uh, make a statue like me. And he was quite taken with this because it became his sort of final life's work, uh, despite all the obstacles later on. Uh, and he then proceeded further along and he joined up with Monge in the Liu Panchan <coughs> Mountains in this area here, uh, somewhat briefly. and. It was a good meeting, and this time, you know, he said, I'd really like to, by then he's getting quite old, 
uh, I'd like to go back to Tibet. And he was quite wealthy by now, of course. He'd received quite a lot of uh, silver from Monge. Um, I don't know how much he'd received from uh, Kublai Khan earlier, but uh, certainly received quite a lot from Monge. And then he wanted to go back, uh, and Monge Khan proceeded further down <coughs> into China proper, where he died in 1259 in August, um, succumbing to the well, the disease there. And Kama Pakshi proceeded, uh, well, he, he remained in this area. Now, Monge Khan died in 1259, and uh, Arik Burke, his youngest brother, declared <coughs> him, well, Kublai Khan first declared himself uh, Khan of Khans, and then Arik Burke also declared himself Khan of Khans, and it was somewhat of a civil war started in 1260. And Kublai Khan, feeling somewhat antagonistic towards Kamapakshi, who had been popular, shall we say, in Arik Burke's court up with Monge Khan up here, ordered Kamapakshi to be, well, to be uh, killed, actually. It was like a death warrant, and had tried to have him killed. And it gets, uh, well, you can read about it in the book, but there were several attempts to kill him, and it didn't seem to work at all. And eventually, Kublai Khan relented somewhat and then said, well, you're going to have to go into ex internal exile, so to speak. So he travelled across to, well, it says an island in, either, not, it doesn't say an ocean, it says a, a lake. Uh, well, it could be an ocean or a lake. So it could be in one of the islands off here, but there is a large just northeast of uh, Shangdu, Xanadu, Xanadu, uh, there's a large lake, which is in quite a desolate area. Kamap actually does mention that it's desolate. And he spent two uh, years there uh, and doing quite a bit of writing. <coughs> and in the meantime, the Civil War more or less ended. Well, it did end. And uh, Kublai Khan was, uh, became Khan of Khans. And he relented on Kamapakshi and called him back uh, to, uh, to near uh, what was to become later Beijing. There was, already there was uh, um, settlements uh, near there, but uh, actual construction started a bit later uh, as a capital. Um, and uh, he, he brought Kamapakshi here and imprisoned him, put him actually in a room, nailed the doors shut, put guards on watch, uh, watches going around, you know, sort of all night, all day and all night around there. But Kamapakshi managed to get out. Um, and at this point, uh, Kublai Khan decided uh, that he would ask him to be his teacher again. Uh, I think Kamapakshi had probably had enough by then <laughs> and said, no, I think I'd really prefer to go back to Tibet. I mean, you know, he's old getting old by then and uh, actually Kublai Khan says fine you know go with my blessing um, do prayers for me wherever you go and that sort of thing uh, so he gradually makes his way uh, but it takes him eight years to get all the way back to central Tibet uh, because he's got you've got to carry all this silver and stuff and then he also stopped here and built several statues in the monasteries associated with Dusum Kempa his previous incarnation, uh, and he then got back to uh, Tsopu and set about building this 60-foot-high uh, statue. Um, we don't have any pictures of it, unfortunately. It was destroyed in the uh, Cultural Revolution of the 60s, and uh, Hugh Richardson did see it and reported on it, but he uh, and he said it was 60 feet high himself, estimated it at, uh, but he didn't take any pictures. Although he did take pictures indoors in the, in the monastery, but uh, not of the statue. I imagine it, was, it may have been quite hard to get a good photograph, um, and dark too. But 
so he got this built here in a remote valley or up to a certain temperature. I think it was probably done by repoussé, you know, beaten metal rather than cast metal. But 60 foot high is uh, extremely high for uh, that time. And there were numerous uh, obstacles to it, uh, but he got it done. And he was presumably getting towards the end of his life. And he next set about the sort of third part of setting up the reincarnation uh, lineage was that uh, when the statue had been built, it very shortly became a, a, a place of pilgrimage. I mean, you would in medieval times. You hear about a 60-foot statue. You're going to go and see it and pay your respects. And a party came from uh, southern Tibet. And in amongst that party was a, an itinerant uh, potter. And he and his wife and at one point, slightly apart from the monastery, uh, Karma Pakshi calls him aside and says, uh, there's an itinerant potter, I'd like to borrow your house. And this is really puzzling because an itinerant potter does not have a house. Uh, he goes from village to village making pots. So he went back to his party, his pilgrimage <coughs> party, and told them this story and they all laughed at him and said, you know, how could you how can you borrow a house from him? Well, it so happened that the potter's wife, uh, several months later, gave birth to a child, which became the third come up. It was recognised as the third come up. Uh, but that's there is a, a book in the same series on the third come up as well by uh, Ruth Gamble, um, and she's got translated in it the third come up as. Um, writing on how he made the transition between in the, the period in between lives, which is very interesting. Uh, anyway, so not only did he sort of prepare the physical side in a way, which, it, well, it seems to be that's what he was indicating. I'm going to borrow your, um, well, maybe I shouldn't put it that way, um, but, you know, can you provide a, a residence for my reincarnation? Uh, and the, uh, he also, a visitor came, Ogyan uh, Rinpoche, and he uh, was a, a well-known uh, traveller, uh, high, sort of high yogi, and he spent three days with Karmapakshi, and they, he transmitted to him uh, various teachings and apparently a, a sort of mind-to-mind -mind transmission as well. And the idea was that uh, Ogyan would be Ogyenpa, would be the one to give the teaching or the transmission to the child that was next born, which is eventually what he did five years later, because uh, <coughs> actually within a year, he had a stroke um, in uh, probably 1282 and then died in 1283. Uh, and five years later, Ogyempa goes uh, to uh, the area where the potter was uh, doing his work, uh, found the child and uh, gave him teaching, recognised him as being uh, a reincarnation and uh, transmitted it, transmitted the teaching to him. And ever since it's been, uh, with the Kamapas anyway, that has been finding young uh, children like that that's helped with the uh, transmission process and keeping the uh, tradition going. So that's really uh, the three points, you know, both him as a teenager finding out up in Karakoram, uh, approaching the emperor uh, for the sake of one person, and then lastly making the preparations, both the physical preparation and the uh, teaching preparation for the next incarnation. Okay. Of course, you mentioned that uh, they practiced at that time Chakra Samvara. Yes. Uh, do you know which tradition like uh, uh, that was uh, with Mongols, especially like which kind of situation? No, it doesn't mention specifically. The reason I'm asking, uh, like yesterday and the day before, there was initiation online mm. uh, to 30, and it was especially for Mongolian audience. So I was oh, right. right. It's just coincidence. Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure that 
it continued from because as you see Monge can't it didn't really last very long yet mm -hmm. all this converting the Emperor that then would have a hugely beneficial effect it kind of didn't last because the Emperor died within a couple of years so uh, it was a bit unfortunate in that way um, but and then it wasn't really later the time of the perhaps the, the fifth Dalai Lama and so forth that the, the Mongols got more interested again um, that it wasn't it didn't take off straight away from Kamabakshi I couldn't say that it hadn't continued there but it's unlikely I would have thought have you have you been physically on all those areas that you are referring to uh, I've been to Karakoram I haven't been to Almadek no Kucha no and neither to uh, uh, yeah. Chengdu, but I've been to Beijing. Yeah. Um, okay. And then Dege, yes, and uh, Tsopu Lhasa, uh, not to, yes I did, I went through, uh, just went through <laughs> Shigatsu. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, uh, Do you know the brown area? Is that the, the, you know? This it's not green, is that, yeah, yes. on the brown area? Yes, that's height, yeah? that's height, ah. it's indicating height. You've got, uh, like, this is really low here. Uh -huh. you okay. know, when they talk about global warming, this is going underwater. <laughs> well, I hope not. But, uh, and then it's just to indicate the heights, really. And then you get into a light brown, and then a dark brown, and then, uh, well, even white here as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just the Kirby Desert. Yes, yes, up here. That's up. Yes, up here. yes. yes. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes, here. Yes. So the question is about the reincarnation. Yes. Is it always, does the person who has been chosen ever notice it for themselves? Is it always, is it always someone says, oh, you're, you've got a connection to the previous person, or you, you're the next incarnation? Do they ever? Yeah, sometimes uh, it's reported, you know, historically, that uh, a child says, I am a Kamapa. For instance, uh, the uh, fourth Kamapa. I think you could say that by the time of the fourth Kamapa, again, they're finding a child, it really has <coughs> become a tradition, really. You know, the first uh, Kamapakshi, you can sort of see there was a big gap in between uh, the previous one and... Uh, then you've got the next one, and the small child is, is chosen, and then the fourth, again, it's a small child, and he actually says, you know, I am Kamapa. Um, so that does occasionally happen, but that's fairly rare. Um, I, it's more, well, yeah, perhaps be a little suspicious of people who go around saying I'm a reincarnation. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, then it, you know, people have to agree, don't they? Um, but, yes. That there are people <laughs> in modern times. <laughs> yes. You can actually, um, uh, there's a register of reincarnates in Beijing. So um, there's, a, there's an office. <laughs> <laughs> you have to apply. <laughs> um, but uh, it, you know, then they investigate it. Uh, there's a bureaucratic thing that goes on uh, just to keep a track of numbers. And I I, well, it may. Seems kind of sensible in one way, as long as it's not used as a controlling thing. I suppose it's hard to tell. It's going to be difficult when the current Dalai Lama dies. You always has interested me in the fact that uh, it has never been a female Lama. There have been there yes, have been. yes, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. just few, unfortunately. Really? Yeah. Okay. Actually, um, there is a manuscript I came across in 2010. I mentioned it's mentioned in more than notes, perhaps, um, that uh, <coughs> this 21 uh, that purports to come from the mouth of Kamapakshi, so that he told this, uh, and 20, well, 17 previous incarnations and four uh, current incarnations, so himself plus three others who were himself as well. <laughs> yeah. And one of those was a woman, amongst all the 21. Um, there was only one. No, there's two women mentioned actually. Yes, yeah. it is. It, but it is unfortunate. Yes.
Equality, equal rights for. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. So I went to Ladakh. Yes. Yeah, yes. And I was there in that monastery where Dalai Lama, you know, uh, preached or, yes. you know, uh, taught his uh, teachings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which was uh, what uh, I found very interesting was the fact that the the Buddhists, the you know, the the Muslims all lived, you know, together in perfect harmony. Harmony really, mm -hmm. you know. So there was no the I'm talking about uh, maybe I don't know, seven years ago or so that when I went yeah, so hasn't always been that way. Yeah. Hasn't always, always been that way. Yeah. No, 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 but then, yeah. you know. It's very nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but in the past, cool. I know there was a lot of uh, fighting and everything. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Charles, I was just wondering, uh, Comrade actually was known for being uh, the one who um, uh, transmitted the idea to uh, sing the Om Nami Padme Om Mantra. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. And do you have a recording? Yes, I do. Yes. Yes. Do you want to talk a little bit? About yes, I will. Yes. Sorry, I, I lost. Does it play the tune? It does. From those times. Sorry. From those times. From those times, yes. Um, Late with the whole recording. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I was just a young man. <laughs> so this. Uh, what happened was, uh, it, when he, you remember he was in retreat in Pungri for 11, 13 years, and he, uh, at one point, he had a dream that these uh, Dakinis, sort of female spiritual beings, came to him and said, uh, uh, sing the, the Avalokiteshvara, the mantra of compassion. And he did, and, he, and they said, uh, you don't know it, <laughs> uh, how to sing it properly. So he said, well, how do you sing it? And they sang it to him. And apparently, he then he mem you know, remembered this, and uh, then uh, started promoting this wherever he went. And there are records from the 16th, 17th century that it was well known and sung communally by by people, uh, according to the Kamapakshi tune, uh, so to speak. And it doesn't <coughs> seem to have survived terribly well, but I did f uh, find um, a person who, uh, uh, Lama Norda, uh, who was quite known as quite a good chanter at um, Palpong Monastery, and he said that he is now deceased, unfortunately. Um, he said that he had. Uh, he knew the tune, so uh, I uh, asked him to sing it and uh, recorded it. And then, um, so it's in the book, the, the tune, I got it transcribed, I'm not musical myself, got it transcribed um, oh, yeah. there, so people can yeah. uh, uh, actually make use of it, uh, to hope they will. Um, so far, not much. And there's a lady, um, Adele Tomlin, who has uh, made her interpretation of it, uh, uh, sung it, um, made a recording. It's, uh, you can find it on mine, uh, Adele Tommy, yeah, yeah. T O M L I. And hopefully yeah, this will be translation. Play. So far, not much interest. So, uh, we'll see what happens. But, uh, I, it's perhaps I don't. Probably a little bit difficult to sing. People do sing the mantra. Um, places like Bodnath, you may have heard. A very simple 
tune, it's all over the internet too, a very uh, easy tune to, but it, it isn't like this one. No. So that may be what's hindering uh, people take, taking it up. Do they? Yes. Yeah, Padme, yes. Yes, well it is, strictly speaking, it is Padme, but Tibetan tend to pronounce it Peme. Yeah.